and welcome to my Secular Sobriety and Addiction Recovery podcast that gives voice to the secular person in recovery. My name is John, and I'm a person in long-term recovery, and we are joined today by Robert Stump, who is the Executive Director of the Life Ring Service Center. How are you doing, Robert? Howdy. Doing well. Out here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Oh, beautiful. Nice. One of my it's favorite cities. Great place to live if you own your house. Right. <laughs> right. I, I bet so. And uh, Robert, this is uh, Ben. Uh, he is my co-host. Hi, How you doing, Ben? Howdy. I'm doing pretty good today. It's uh, great to be here with you guys. So Ben lives in Omaha and I'm in Kansas City. Yeah, isn't this great? The Zoom and being able to converse across the country and internationally too. Yeah. Absolutely. For that matter. Yeah. Well, Ben and I have been podcasting together for a while. Um, I, I do another podcast that's more oriented towards the um, atheist and agnostic in AA. And we started this one because I really wanted to get into topics that were kind of away from the 12 steps and, and looking more at secular options that people have like life ring. And so it's, it's great to have you here. And um, we were talking a little bit by email. Would, would you like to begin with um, starting with your story and we'll let a conversation evolve from there? Yeah, probably um, as you pointed out, I am the executive director of Life Ring. I've been here since 2012 um, after the founder stepped down, uh, uh, Marty Nicholas. Uh, he's still he's still alive and well. Works he lives in Berkeley, California, and he's actually um, updates the books. We sell a, a series of books that he's written, and he'll peri periodically come in and update stuff as need be. So anyway, like I said, I was I've been here since 2012 in the, an official capacity. I actually was I drank for about 35 years. Alcohol is my choice of. Uh, drug um, and I went into recovery um, three times in 10 years. I started maybe when I was 55, I'm 67 now. Um, but in 97, 2003, and I might've been younger than that, maybe that time frame. but I, I know in, in 1997, 2003 and 2006, I went into a recovery program Kaiser out here in the Bay Area. Uh, it was a 90 day program. It was not in house. It was outpatient hmm. um, service. Uh, you had to go to two, three outside meetings a week. Initially, it was three, then they cut it down to two in the third month. Um, the first time I survived eight months. The second time I survived almost to the end of the program, started drinking the last week of the program. And the third time in 2006, I have 14 years of recovery. Um, now I, I kind of give you that history because initially in 1997, the only program that was available to me was the 12 step program. Uh, AA was, you know, I tried my best. Uh, and I, I forced myself to go to meetings because it was the only game in town. Uh, it was a, for me, my worldview, it was a bizarre situation. Yeah. Uh, I just did not. Um, and it, also, it is interesting. I went to a number of meetings. I didn't go to any uh, atheist or agnostic meetings. I know they exist in the Bay Area, but uh, then I didn't. I didn't know what actually i didn't know what i was why i didn't connect the, the crowd i couldn't connect with it wasn't part of my tribe etc mm -hmm. um my religious um upbringing i had 13 years of catholicism uh, education and i actually sang in the choir and participated in church every sunday mass all the way up to uh right before the first time I went into recovery. Um, so they had a long time there of uh, participating in the, in, in, in the mass and, and being a Catholic individual. Um, so anyway, it fundamentally came down to spirituality and the fact that I 
didn't believe yeah. that something like that existed. Mm-hmm. That, um, so the, I mean, that's the main issue I had. The 12 step itself, I had issues with, with uh, uh, you know, first of all, giving myself up to another entity, mm-hmm. which didn't make any sense to me. I got myself in this situation. Right. I had best yeah. get myself out of this situation. Yeah. At three o'clock in the morning, uh, when I'm by myself, I mean, it's there's nothing going to come into the room or shine upon me or uh, my friends aren't going to be there. I got to figure out some way of dealing with this on my own. Uh, and it took a while. I mean, recovery is a slippery slope, they say. Uh vast majority of people don't make it the first time or second time or you know for some people it's a continual process it's a journey yeah uh hopefully at the end you die sober and not under the influence but you know uh, those are decisions you have to make so anyway the third time uh second time actually life ring was available in 2003 life ring started in the bay area in oakland california by marty nicholas um and it was slowly building up meetings. There were meetings out in the facility I was in. Um, 2003, I started going to those meetings and AA. Uh, but like I said, I started drinking almost at the end of the 90-day uh, mm-hmm. program the second time. Um, so 2006, I go back in there um, and it, they, they had five life ring meetings, almost one meeting a night. So I, I took that up. I finally committed myself to sobriety. I said I had to figure out uh, something, you know, because I couldn't continue what I was doing. It was getting pretty bad. Um, so I did that, went to meetings. Uh, I actually, Kaiser was a great program. Uh, I finally got got what they were doing. I went to aftercare for two additional years, uh, one night a week. I took antabuse uh, for two years. Um, I did what I could to make sure I stayed on the straight and narrow. But I didn't go to AA meetings. That was good because that was a depressing situation. Yeah. So Life Ring was available. I came, became a convener. A convener is a person that kind of leads a meeting. Um, uh, second year out, I, I became a convener and I did that for a couple of years. I came into the, um, cause the service center was Oakland, was located in Oakland, California. I got to know Marty. I went to uh, monthly convener meetings there. He asked for somebody to help out with the finance and I volunteered and it would progress from there. Well, cool. So, nice. Uh, that's 2012. That's when I uh, took on the executive director. Okay. And what, nice. what do you do as, as executive director? Answer all the emails, uh, bookkeeping. We are a very, very small organization. Mm-hmm. We have 50 meetings in the Bay Area, and then it spreads out okay. from there. Okay. We have uh, international meetings, Canada, England, um, Ireland, and Sweden. Uh-huh. We started a couple of meetings in Sydney, Australia, here in the last couple of months. Um, so it's it's still, we are a very small organization. Smart Recovery is much bigger than us. Mm-hmm. So I'm pretty much the person involved. It's kind of a part-time job for me, but I enjoy it immensely Yeah. in yeah. terms of the administrative portion. So I do, it's a handyman type job. I just do everything that uh, needs to be done to promote the uh, name. We do have a board of directors, nine members, mm-hmm. and they uh, kind of do the long-term planning and fundraising, et cetera. Well, you know, I've been in AA for like 31 years, and um, I think it's great now that there are options for people who walk into the rooms of AA and find like you, it's totally not for them. And that's becoming, I think, more, that's becoming more common now with uh, people that are now in their 30s and 40s. They they don't relate 
And I think part of the problem is just the the ancient literature that is still used there. But anyway, I, became, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just became interested in these other options like Life Ring. And I, I just think that we should give voice to organizations like this. I think 50 meetings a week sounds like a lot. Um, and that's that's insane. No, no. no. I said there are 50 meetings in the Bay Area. In the Bay Area. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty good. <clears throat> uh, in the nine counties surrounding the, the, the okay. uh, the San Francisco Bay. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, go that that's good. It's nothing compared to the twelve-step uh, phenomenon, yeah. which on every other corner there's a, a meeting. But you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Robert, how yeah. does how does one start a life ring meeting? Is it do they need to contact you, or is it um, how does that work? Yeah, well, they uh, would have to contact me if they want to get listed on the website. Mm -hmm. uh, six months of sobriety. And um, uh, email is sent out, um, welcoming them. We have links on the website that they can go investigate. We have a, a starter kit for 50 bucks. They don't have to, um, you know, we're, we're willing to be flexible with the money. We're not there to make money. We're there to get the uh, word out. And, and the, the starter kit has, I have some books over here. They, uh, four books and pamphlets that uh, they get one book is how was your week, which is actually how to uh, fundamentally run a life ring meeting and all the um, do's and don'ts and, you know, things to watch out for and how to get a location and mm -hmm. uh, what to do with the people once you have them, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How might a typical meeting operate? Like how, how would it open and what are the types of things that people tend to talk about? And, and could okay. you compare that with your experience in AA? Well, AA is, a, is, is not quite a, a flat organization. It is peer uh, uh, leadership, only they're in the front and you're in a row. There are some meetings you go to, they're in a circle, stuff like that. But anyway, a traditional AA meeting, 12-step meeting is you're in a row and you're looking at these people that are supposed to be kind of more knowledgeable than you. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Um, in a <clears throat> uh, life ring meeting, you sit in a circle, chairs are in a circle. Um, you start by... Uh, I, I give an opening statement about what the concepts of life ring is about. Life ring is about in terms of uh, the three S's, sobriety, secularity, and self-help. Um, explain a little bit about those three concepts. Then I ask um, that we normally do the meeting by a how was your week concept, because normally most people are early in recovery, they can't think long-term, they can they can barely think about it yesterday. Right. So um, you give an account of, um, if you wish to, um, you know, how your week is this week or what you think is going to happen next week. You, uh, for me, uh, conveners are, are given a lot of leeway in how they handle the group dynamics of the meeting. So I will also say if there's something that's bothering you, if there's something that was wonderful that happened to you, uh, you can also talk about that too. Mm -hmm. um, crosstalk is allowed. So people can comment. They can say, yes, I, I, I agree with that or that concept didn't work for me, but here's what I did. So it's a best practice type of um, uh, concept where you kind of try to, the group talks out what they think works best for each individual because it's not going to work for right. the other individual, but they share these ideas and they um, kind of bond in the meeting. Now I do a, um, um, ironically at the same facility that I went to for the three times in recovery, I do a, uh, a meeting there at 1230 on Fridays where the people are in uh, early recovery from mm -hmm. one day to four weeks. And then once they're done with that program, they put them into the 90 day program. So I have these people only for four weeks. Um, and it's just phenomenal to see uh, for the most part, how they blossom, how people get better over week after week. And so in that meeting, Kaiser kind of says, you have to go to it. Um, 
but I tell the people now that, you know, that, uh, you, you're not required to come to this meeting. Right. Um, it is an outside meeting, so I, I can write, uh, they can get credit for going to the meeting, just like mm -hmm. they can for a 12-step meeting. Um, well, even alone, even alone, that is great to have that choice. Choice and recovery is so important. That's yeah. fundamentally what I uh, go for. I don't, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I uh, say life ring is an option and you might like that option, but check out for women, women for sobriety. Right. Um, DOMA, they used to be um, refuge recovery. Now they're DOMA recovery, mm -hmm. a Buddhist based recovery uh, system. Check yeah. that out. I, I, and check out the 12 step program and take the best of all those concepts and meld them together so they are uh, an internal part of you mm -hmm. because you know you're supposed to you you would assume you got to do this the rest of your life right would you, you know, have you ever had have you had uh would you say a lot of people that come to life ring or people who have tried aa and end up like i don't like yeah that? in the bay area and that's the only vast portion of experience i have most people go to AA and Life Ring. Mm -hmm. It's a, we don't, you know, we're a, a neutral organization. Right. We don't care where you get your uh, support from, where you figure out a plan. The third part of the three S is, is self-help. Right. And in that, yeah. it, it incorporates, incorporates a concept of uh, figuring out something that will work for you hopefully for the rest of your life to keep sober and to have a quality of life. If you're not happy, you're probably not going to stay sober. Absolutely. So you have to, it's a, it's a, a multifaceted uh, thing you have to figure out mm -hmm. um, to replace what you've been doing in the past. Now it's hard. I, you know, you, you observe this, or at least I, I see it. People with mental illness who've been masking that. Right it's much more difficult for them to figure out stuff mm -hmm. until, uh, you know, the longer they're sober, the more stable they become. And uh, it seems to work uh, better, but that's, that's a um, subgroup of people that um, sometimes have a difficult time. It would appear. Yeah, for well, sure. Life ring doesn't have like a, a set program, like uh, you know, that you follow. It just allows people to find their own, yeah, it's a one hour thing, so it doesn't go on forever. And it's, it, it like I said, you go in a circle, and, and I didn't mention this before, but normally a person starts, they say their first name, they indicate their last drug of choice and how long they've been clean. Hmm. And then they say, how was your week? Or, you know, they go on a topic and they're done. Then it goes, they pick a direction and it goes to the next person. It goes all the way around the room. Sometimes, usually, actually, most of the time, because the way people share and stuff, that takes up the hour. Sometimes it's emotional, especially people early in, you know, the first couple of days or weeks in recovery. Uh, it's an emotional experience because some of them have never experienced this before. Uh, recovery, not the meeting itself. Right. But, right. And, but, and um, they like the crosstalk. They yeah. really do like the fact that they're able to discuss and other people are able to comment and that's what they totally miss from the AA. Right. Program. Right. Yeah. yeah. If they had 12 steps and crosstalk. <laughs> <Yeah. Right. laughs> well, depending on the meeting, you'll get that too. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's some in the Bay area that I think do that. Yeah. And do um, you, uh, do the people that go to the meetings, do they socialize afterwards? Is there kind of like a community outside the meeting? No, see, yeah. that's the problem. I mean, there are some fundamental differences. There's also fun, uh in terms of people like this, and some of these people continue on, but there seems to be a difference in the the type of individual that likes life ring or likes the twelve step program. Mm -hmm. You know, and no, we're not a social. We try to be. I mean, there are conveners that will go out to dinner afterwards mm -hmm. with you know people that in the group there are conveners that will organize an event a bowling event or uh, but that is really on an individual basis what those conveners do we don't have any uh, uh 
group-wide uh, initiative to incorporate these people in a, in a social right. group environment. Someday, maybe. Yeah. But these, these people are usually, like me, especially the more long-term individuals who keep going back to meetings and meetings. And we're not required, we're not telling people they need to keep coming back right. on programs. I mean, use, use the program as you need it and go out and enjoy life. If right. You don't need it. right. Right. So there's no mandatory thing that you've got to keep coming back. Uh, yeah. But some people do. Yeah. Um, I think it's but, that it's that all or nothing thinking that often turned me off and turns me off from AA. Like if you're not here, you're running a risk or you're in trouble. Or if you haven't seen somebody in a while, they're always seem like they're shocked to think that you haven't drank if you see them later, you know. Oh, well, you're gone for so long. I'm sure I would have been sure you drank or something, but I, I, like you said earlier about the choice, the choice is important. And I think sometimes that's where the tone of AA meetings misses the boat. It's like, if you don't agree with most of what you hear, or everything, what you hear, well, then you fit in this category of sliding down that slippery slope and you're in trouble. And then it almost becomes a self self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes, I think so. Especially mm -hmm. when they're forced into the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And we do get better. I mean, you do get to a point where, it's, it's your sober life becomes the normal life and the risk of drinking is much, much reduced to where um, I think a person could go on with their life and enjoy their life and they don't necessarily have to attend meetings, you know, um, for, forever. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of realizing that now it's taken me a long time, but um, I'm almost ready to retire from being in recovery. And I don't know, <laughs> but on the other hand, I enjoy it too. I enjoy, I enjoy watching people get better. I enjoy, I enjoy seeing mm -hmm. people get their lives together and the whole um, recovery um, community and especially what's happening now with um, more, more options becoming available is, is interesting to me too. So I kind of like being part of it for that reason as well. Yeah. But yeah, we do get better. There's no reason that we have to think, in my opinion, that, you know, we're somehow, you know, diseased forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you believe in that concept, yes. Yeah, I guess you could. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you got to, you, you do, when you reflect, the 12-step program is a social program. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the strength. Yeah, I do too. A and a lot of people probably not me, but a lot of people feel the, the, the comradeship supports them and that's why they go. The 12 steps, yeah, you right. know, they, they, they might eventually get to that. They might get a sponsor. I mean, it's kind of pushed on you evidently, mm -hmm. but I know there are people that go to these meetings, but they don't have sponsors or they're not doing the 12 steps. You know, mm -hmm. uh, but it's the social thing that, and it, because they're in a, a tribe Right. like them they're right. they're surrounded with people that and you know I, I, it's I not as about that last week we both think that that's the great strength of i think really almost any support system is that connection that you have with other people that are like you mm -hmm. that, are, that, are, that have had the same problem you know that's why church i mean that's in essence uh, people will disagree with me of course but in essence the 12-step program is a religion it is. It was uh, yeah, I agree. And it uh, offers the, all the good benefits of a religion. Mm -hmm. You know, religion's not bad per se. No. Um, it offers a lot of um, uh, social, uh, you know, interactions and, and you get sick, people come and visit you, stuff like that. I mean, there's... I think... The, go ahead, Robert. I'm sorry. No, no. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I was going to say, I think <clears throat> along the lines of what we've been talking about, and I think where my concern falls with AA as well as religion, it's like if you ever express anything that is outside the norm or even remotely would challenge anything, like bring up a question, it seems like there starts to be that subtle shunning or that pushing away that it's almost like it feels like a punishment <laughs> of taking away your community if you dare speak out. So then it's um, the yeah. counselor in me says that somewhere each individual person has to dig in emotionally and figure out what is their truth, what is true for them, and to have a safe place to express things like that that tend to be more secular, like smart or life ring. I'm loving what I hear about that. And just be able to express that and have a place where you're accepted where you're at, which hasn't always been my experience either with religion or in most AA rooms too. 
Well, I'll yeah. tell you one of the strengths I see from LifeRing as compared to even the secular AA meetings is that LifeRing takes it all off. It takes that subject, whether you're an atheist, agnostic, or religious person, it doesn't, it's not even material, you know? Mm -hmm. And whereas with a secular AA meeting, there's that thing that says, you know, we're secular, we're not, and there's, and there's that dynamic involved with it. You know, where I, I think it would be ideal just to have where, you know, yeah, if you're religious, if you go to church, that's great. But that's not what this is about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. What you use for your mm -hmm. personal strength, mm -hmm. and I say this in the meeting so that people don't think we're an atheist group or whatever. Oh, yeah. You kind of use what what tools you have to to keep you sober yep. and you use the whole bag of tools. And if you're a religious person, a spiritual person, definitely use that yeah. to uh, keep you sane and sober. You know? And I was reading on the website, um, LifeRing website, that probably about 40% of the people that go to LifeRing meetings probably um, are just like the reg rest of the population. About 40% of them do go to church, are religious. Yeah. And then, the, and then the rest aren't. But it's not even an issue. It's not something that ever even comes up. Right. Just like in normal society. It's not like we talk about <laughs> our religion and at work or, or any other part of our life. It's just, it's something that should be private, I think, not part of our recovery. But I'm finding more and more people that um, that is really important. They're, they're, they don't want their belief to be involved with a serious problem like addiction and overcoming addiction. You know, it just doesn't make, it just doesn't make sense to mm -hmm. have that be the, be the answer. So it's great to have these, it's great to have these options. It's also, you know, it's, it's because we are of a um, Christian background, Judeo-Christian background, mm -hmm. Muslims, how do they deal exactly. with this whole situation? Right. Yeah. You know, we, we get a lot of them in our group. They're, they're mm -hmm. very religious, mm -hmm. but they're not forced to acknowledge a Christian God right. Uh, right. in order to re be in recovery. Yep. Yeah, I brought that up many times when I was more active in my home group in uh, in Lincoln instead of up here in Omaha, and people would be kind of flabbergasted. They never really thought about that. And you know, we have we have certainly a decent enough population of minority religions in in all these areas, and it's uh, that no one considers that part. It seems like. Mm -hmm. I would yeah. like to see a life ring. Uh, I'd like to see it grow more in this area too. I don't know if we have any meetings in, in uh, Kansas city um, or this. Vicinity. No, yeah. no, yeah. you don't. Yeah. It's, and, it's, it's so hard. Mm -hmm. it, it's a matter of hard. luck. Um, Smart got a over a hundred thousand uh, dollar donation when they were starting uh, from a uh, benefactor. And they, they obviously run a different model than, right. than uh, LifeRing does. We, you know, the, we have no professional people in our organization. Okay. Th in the leadership portion of it. Nobody yeah. has. And I'm not sure what we'd do if somebody did. Uh, uh -huh. We'd probably accept them. I mean, but we, we would say you got to put the therapist's hat here because right. you are a person in recovery and that's how you approach you know, yeah, it's it's more real peer to peer. I, I I'm learning more about um, smart. I'm taking the the smart training just to learn about it. Yeah. And um, yeah, it, it seem it does seem like it's got that component that I'm a little concerned about, where it's like the person who facilitates the meeting has some sort of expertise or something, um, and it it just puts a, it puts a lot of pressure, I think, on the person who's running the meeting, and it's just kind of a different dynamic. But I don't want to judge it yet because I'm still learning about it. Mm -hmm. but but that that is different that is different from what i'm used to and i think it sounds like it's different from life ring too yeah it's more of a top down because there's yeah. an instructor and there are people that listen they do talk there is cross talk in the meeting and stuff like that but it's yeah. a completely different model yeah and there are benefits to that model that's why they have a lot more meetings yep mm -hmm. yep i think uh something you said robert made me think about this too like in early recovery it can be so tough and it's emotional for a lot of people when you're first contemplating getting sober or actually doing something about it. And I don't know if I'm making too big of a blanket statement, but it's like sometimes the 12 step groups provide this perfect, not perfect, but this structured format that says, this is the answer. And that appeals to some people, whether it I does, think it's yeah. true or not, but it's also like my father-in-law who is always constantly looking for the perfect diet that is going to make everything <laughs> click. And his, 
workout schedule and how many miles he rides on his bike, there's like some perfect number to reach that is going to result in some optimal result. And as a, somebody who used to be a counselor, um, th- I think sometimes that's the mindset that we have to get over on some level, like that life ring proposes. If you go to AA grade, if you go to smart grade, if you heard a podcast where you heard this great saying, great, mm-hmm. take from everywhere around you that you can get the truth. And it's, it's more of an internally motivated, emotionally based uh, therapeutic process, I think, rather than you're doing it right. You tell me how to do it. And this person's doing it right. Well, now let me try that. Instead of it's like, grab all that stuff and form your own thing here about what's working for you. Because sure as heck, I know what works for John or what works for you is at least a little bit different than what, than what works for me. And I think more people are doing that, Ben. I think Mm -hmm. that, I think the vast majority of people who are getting sober today are not getting sober in the rooms of AA or maybe even any other program. Uh, but I'm seeing a lot of people just connecting online, the YouTube community, for example, the people that are helping mm-hmm. each other there. Absolutely. Um, people on Twitter, social even, media, you know? twi- all kinds of things. Yeah. It's amazing. And w- what's happening, and it's really kind of, you know, it's under the radar, but, you know, people are meeting online and oftentimes that will turn into real, you know, face to face relationships. Mm-hmm. But, but there's, and there, it's more of a mix and a match type of uh, approach, which, which is smart, really. Right. So, well, I even say this in the secular community amongst AA, and I know we're not trying to just talk about that. It feels like there's more of that going on than, than when my experience more in traditional AA, it's more about people getting to know each other. And I know AA is a social thing too, but it seems like it's more beholden to this hallowed 12 steps. And that's what I really like from what I'm hearing about Robert about life ring is that it's no, it's about us humans right here who are sitting meeting right now in this room and talking. Yeah. You know, you were talking about the social stuff and YouTube stuff like that. I think people are being exposed to the concept that you have permission to do it your own way, Mm -hmm. that you don't have to do it this way or that way. Uh, And some of the braver people, not everyone, obviously, but some of the braver people are saying, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. I can do it my way. Mm -hmm. I also like the growing movement I see of people who are um, coming out openly as being in recovery and not hiding in their in their anonymity. Mm-hmm. Um, that I think is a is really important. Um, that I'm 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 getting to be more that way. That it's not like I wear it on my sleeve or anything, but I don't necessarily want to hide from the world that I'm in recovery because there's nothing wrong, wrong with that. And it's good for people to know that, yeah, you know, this is a, this is a problem that human beings have and there it's possible to overcome it. Yeah. I mean, I've never been been anonymous and I didn't have a high stake job. Yeah. Uh, When I was working, uh, I, it doesn't bother me to say what I, my roots, where I came from. In fact, it is a source of strength. It's not yeah. shame for me. Yeah. You know, I got 14 years now. Yeah. Soon I will have more years with my counting my youth, more years on earth than a uh, sober than under the influence. That's yeah. nice. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. I'm, I'm finding it more accepted too, just like we've got two young kids. And so I'm interacting with more other people's uh, other kids' parents. And so, you know, I don't just immediately say, Hey, I don't drink. But if some, another parent is talking to me about going on a golf trip and they talk about all the crazy stuff they do and party and stuff. And I'll say like, Oh yeah, I used to do that, man, but I kind of lost my right to do that. And I, (laughs) I get a lot more people like nodding and grinning and laughing and being more accepting of that Mm -hmm. than I used to. Um, um, whereas maybe, maybe it was the way I phrased it in the past too. It was too much AA lingo when I would talk about it, but, um, it's, it does seem, and I think for a while there, it got kind of trendy to be sober, you know, uh, even amongst Hollywood and stuff like that. People were wearing it on their sleeves a little bit more. And some people think that's bad, but I, I think it's great anytime anybody talks about it, just like you guys are saying. Yeah. yeah, guilt is one of those things that's not talked about much, but is so, such a heavy burden mm-hmm. in uh, you know, I'm going to say it in the, tw- what I was exposed to in the 12 step program mm-hmm. and it's still what I'm exposed to. I mean, there are people that will argue with you and say, Oh no, this is this and that I, I find because of the religious component component 
and Adam and Eve and, the, you know, original sin and you have to be washed clean and mm -hmm. you got to keep going back. And I, I just, but it's that burden that, you know, if you don't do the 12 steps, you're not clean. You still have guilt, you know, yeah. it just, it, it can, I guess some people can handle it. It would just, yeah. I would think it would destroy other people. I John find it interesting too that like, um, well, for smart, that whole idea of looking at your past, you know, your, your, uh, you know, all the resentments and all the problems that you had in the past is less important than figuring out what's going on today in the here and now. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, okay, so I'm behaving this way now. Why am I behaving this way now? What is it that's going on with me today? That's, in, that's affecting me rather than looking back in the past that's kind of interesting. I mean, I kind of found, I found some of that stuff kind of helpful, I guess, but maybe it really wasn't necessary to do all of that. You know? yeah. I drank because I loved the taste of alcohol. I loved the way, what it did to me. And, you know, I'm becoming, when you talk about it, you have these re reflections and you, you, you create stories in your mind as to mm -hmm. how things progressed and whether it actually happened or not nobody knows but it seems to me, i do remember the first time i drank and the, the 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 it was the greatest experience in the world and it really helped with social lubrication i, I was able to to mingle with people and you know it was it was wonderful and i found that i was able to over time i was able to consume a lot more and than other people and still function what apparently you know uh, until later in life, um, all, you know, I was able to function all right. So mm -hmm. I had a, to a higher tolerance for it, uh, which was my downfall. But uh, it it seems to me that w when I continued to drink, I was trying to recapture that first experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because it was just, it was a... You know, <laughs> I just wonder if that's what people are trying to do. You know, yeah. not people that are mentally ill or have emotional issues that are masking or, or somehow. I don't I don't have emotional. You know, I'm not I don't mm -hmm. I've never been under the care of anything or taken any mm -hmm. uh, stuff for mental illness. So and abuse and stuff. I don't think I ever had that. At least mm -hmm. I don't remember. it. Mm -hmm. I think I drank because I just enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, yeah. It, it, you know. yeah. And to a certain point, I guess it doesn't really matter. And I, I also think that I, I think the same way. I mean, I, I had all kinds of things going on in my upbringing, but the bottom line was I, I somehow became addicted to alcohol. And I, I think it's because of what was going on in my brain. That's just what I think, but it doesn't, doesn't really matter when it comes down to how I stay sober, you know, really, which is to not drink. And that's, that's the thing about life ring. Life ring is, is abstinence based. Um, and you know, so, so is, um, so is, um, smart, but we were talking to someone, but, but yeah, <laughs> right, but we were talking with Sally last week about harm reduction and it's not necessarily everybody in smart is, is, is expected to have abstinence as their goal. And that's fine. That's I, fine. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah but it is different. I, yeah. I just, people, you know, in the opening statement, I'll say, uh, you know, life ring, um, is, is soberly based. We, we're absolutely, we're absent, you know, we don't drink mm -hmm. or use. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean that you can't moderate. And most of you in the room have tried to moderate. Right. You know, it always comes back that they've tried to, you know, it's just natural for somebody that abuses right. uh, something to moderate it and try to control it. But there's plenty of people, you know, you get myopic because you think, you know, alcohol and drugs are so bad. 70% of the population, 80% have no problems right. with using right. it. That's it's just right. that 20 or 30%. You know, the people here in this room, you can't do it. Now, does uh, thing also welcome people that have like um, eating disorders and other? We, things? no. Okay. I mean, the board made a decision, uh, not that we cannot uh, financially support it or, or mm. we, we, or listed on the website at this point. But we certainly, when I talk to people, I tell them, go ahead, use the yeah. concepts if, they, if it works for you. Because yeah. I do get calls for sex addiction, gambling, et cetera. Mm -hmm. 
The other thing is Al Anon. I get calls for people who want to know if Lifering has a partners or loved ones uh, yeah. program, which we don't. No. We're no, just too small. There's a big need for that. There's a big need for the secular um, family organizations. There's not a lot of it. There's a couple of secular Al Anon meetings that are coming, uh, that are starting up, but that's just now um, a new thing. So. Well, Robert, I really appreciate you doing this. It was very, very nice of you. And yeah. I would really love to speak with more people from uh, Life Ring. So if you would let, let anyone know that um, if they would like to come on just to share their story, I would love to have that. Um, I think I really want this to be a platform for um, secular options other than the 12 steps to be, um, to be given voice to. And uh, so that's what this is all about. So thank you for participating. I really appreciate that. Okay. I can yeah. share your email address with um, maybe other board members or mm -hmm. I'm not going to publish it and put it out in the world, but uh, some yeah. select people. Okay. That'd be great. And see if they, you know, want to participate. Well, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate okay. it. So I'm going to yeah, sign thank us you, out Robert. with our, and there we go. And that was another episode. <laughs> this is always so much fun. <laughs> My secular society. <laughs> and thank you for listening. Thanks, Robert. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I uh, hopefully I was able to share something of value. Oh yeah, that's a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. That's great. I'm I'm just uh it, it was just I was so excited that you agreed to do this. I I cuz this is a brand new podcast. I thought, well, who's going to want to come on here because we don't really have anybody listening yet. <laughs> but we will eventually. We have a podcast um that I do the, the like the one that's on the the secular AA people and that's pretty well listened to by a lot of people, but I I feel like I'm in a box there because not necessarily of the steps, but of the traditions. You know, anytime I talk about something that I want to talk about that's not in scope of the traditions, people jump all over me. And I was getting so tired of that. Mm -hmm. And and so mm -hmm. that's why I started this podcast because it lets me explore things like life ring and smart and um, harm reduction and you know all kinds of other things that I'm interested in. Robert, do you guys have any life ring uh, watchdogs who give people purity tests to make sure <laughs> they're saying the right thing? Uh, no, <laughs> uh, this is not. based on individual. I mean, we, you know, uh, there, there'll be some people that try to scam you, you know, come in, they're sober, they say, and they're really under the influence, stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. But um, it no, feels like, no. a, yeah, like John's saying, it's like people, everybody's always quick to jump on something you're saying wrong or doing wrong and yeah, control, try to control the message. Yeah, one thing, and I didn't get into this and it, we, I didn't have to, but there are, because of the 12-step program and the harm that's been done, perceived harm that's been done to people, uh, you got to be careful at, at some meetings and keep the tone down because some people come with a, a, a chip on their shoulder against the 12-step program right you know they'll they, they some, somehow they got injured and they'll come into life ring and you know especially if there's two or three of them in the group they'll start talking and as a convener you gotta you know you gotta take it outside that's yeah. another group and we're in here to talk about recovery not about that's another thing that they, they had the same problem like that with the secular aa groups the people who have been harmed <laughs> by yeah. the the traditional aa they come in and they call it, um, they call it, what they call it? Something detox, God detox. They yeah, call God it detox, yeah. God detox. So people come in and they've been, they're so upset that all they want to do is, is bash AA, you know, and, and, and a lot of times that's, that has to go on for a while until they get it out of their system. <laughs> that funny? It's, it's disrupted to the one hour session it that is. we have. So it we, totally is, yeah. we tell them to take it, you know, take, take it, it out. outside. <laughs> I'd we probably have to say something as much as I'd love to join in with you right now. Uh, this is not good for our group and we need to take it yeah. outside the rooms later. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I'll pass the word around, pass okay, the email you. around and maybe you'll get some more bites. Okay. Well, thank you. I do appreciate it. And I also have a, I'll send you a link if I can find it up uh, a, some program where, the family is helped. It's a secular program, uh, kind of like um, Al Anon. Okay. Al Anon, but uh, it's run by some person. He goes around the country and, and gives workshops or something. Oh, I'd be interested in seeing that. Um, yeah.
I, I, you know, as I told you before, I'm my main goal is choice and recovery. Yeah. It's not here. one way is going to work. Nope. Absolutely right. No, um, so that's what I promote. Yep. Life too. ring too, but choice and recovery. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, There's no reason people can't mix and match all kinds of different things. They should be able to anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Only if they're not a okay. real alcoholic. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, take care, Robert. Thanks okay, again. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, Robert. Bye. All right, Ben. So we can go into our overtime session if you'd like to. Sure. What do you think about that? You know, I'm finding myself wishing there was a lot more Life Ring meetings. I suppose there's one way to change that, right? Yeah. I like Life Ring because to me, it seems like it's a nice amalgam between um, SMART and AA. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it doesn't have the hardcore scientific -y stuff of smart and it has and it doesn't have the religious component of AA, but it still mm -hmm. has the people, the peer one on one, one person talking to another kind of component. Right. But I also found it interesting that he said that there isn't a lot of socializing outside of the meeting. Like, I don't know, maybe there isn't really a whole lot of that in AA either, but um, I think there's maybe there's more of it. I, I know when I was younger. I, I socialize with people outside the meetings a lot. Yeah. yeah, it depends. You know, like around here, the young people's groups are super social, almost to the detriment of recovery at times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I went out to lunch with people all the time in, in, in Lincoln, but sometimes it felt like you had to be a part of the cool kid group to, to get invited out to lunch and stuff. And it, it didn't mm -hmm. always feel so inclusive. And as we always talk about all this stuff, it's all depends on which meeting, you know, I know, I came down to your meeting in Kansas city a few times and we went out to supper afterwards mm -hmm. with other people. And that was, mm -hmm. I, I always enjoy that part of it. And I, like yeah. you said too, and Robert said, I think the truth is there's more people doing it their way, but it's very frowned upon talking about that in a meeting. Right. Oh yeah. You know, but yeah. if you talk one-on-one -on -one with somebody after a meeting, especially even if they've been around a long time, they'll be like, yeah, that's bullshit. Everybody just does what they does it do. It, anyway. is, it is true. You know, I even know at my old traditional group, um, you know, I bet you more than half the people didn't have sponsors, Yeah, but they wouldn't talk. They wouldn't say so right. because it, isn't that weird that the people who have that, that self-righteous, I have my sponsor, my sponsor says this, that for whatever reason, their voice dominates the conversation where, yeah. whereas you think that that's what you're supposed to be saying. That's where my anti-authority kicked in at the end of going to meetings down in Lincoln, because I would just speak out and say that openly. And of course, people would tell me I'm getting people killed. And I'd, I'll say dishonesty is what gets people killed. Yeah. You know, and I would never tell anyone I wouldn't, you know, I'd always give it the prefix of, hey, you know, this is just what works for me. I think it's a good idea to have a sponsor, especially when you're new to the program. I don't know mm -hmm. if I believe that to be true, but that was me trying to cover my bases with people in the meeting. So I didn't get attacked afterwards. Um, I want to thank you. I got distracted during the interview because the sun started shining in. Well, I you thought maybe that? it was the sign. <laughs> and I was like, oh my shit. I, I had to turn off the video because it was just, it was just yeah. looking too, too stupid. But then. Yeah. I didn't know if uh, you had to shut things down for a little bit or not. So I just kind of <laughs> stepped in there a little bit. Well, I appreciate that. Cause I was like yeah. totally distracted. I don't know what was going on during that period of time. <laughs> yeah. I was expecting your cat to come walking across. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I loved what Robert said too. Option is a good thing and having options is a good thing. And again, that's where those 12 step dogmatists drive me crazy. They make it sound like if you're not doing something, you know, if you're not doing things the way they think they need to be done, you're in trouble. Yeah. And I think they moved the bar on that too, that you never, the, the bully aspect of those hardcore sponsors in 12 step meetings is that they're always moving the bar on you. It's like a little control game. Mm -hmm. So, well, you know, it'll be interesting if, if, to see if, if this podcast gets any traction mm -hmm. and if we can um, get people from Smart and um, Life Ring and just YouTubers or whoever that are finding, that are finding ways other than the 12 steps. Yeah. I, I mean, I just think it's interesting. And, and if you get, if you give that, that um, a platform where people can talk about it to see if it gains any traction or gains any interest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't see why it's he. It's interesting. He said that Smart got like a big grant or something. Somebody donated a lot of money to give yeah. them a head start, whereas Life Ring doesn't have that. So the money situation is one reason that Smart has grown so quickly, I guess, and Life Ring hasn't. Well, look at how much of a difference. I mean, in the big picture of things, hundred thousand dollars—that's a lot of money to us. Of but I mean, it's it's 
in the big picture, it's not that much, but it's a huge jump start for something like That's that, true. that it can make that much of a difference. That's true. Not to get political, but it's like if somebody was allowed to own land a long time ago and somebody else wasn't, right. which person is more start. likely to be a little bit further ahead now? No, you're right about that. But I wonder why they, they could probably get some grants, but maybe it's part of their charter. They don't want to do that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah it could be. And I'm from what I'm hearing too, again, I haven't researched it as well as I should. Um, Life ring sounds like it will work really well in a smaller group of people because yeah. like in counseling, if you get, it's because it sounds a little bit almost more like small group therapy where people are giving each other feedback and trying yeah. to help people see into their own blind spots. So you get more than about eight people in a group and that starts to not work so good. The ideal yeah. small group size is about six to eight people. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too. He was taught, he was describing AA from the San Francisco um, experience. And I'm sure that those meetings are huge because he was talking like what we would think of the Midwest as speaker meetings. Right. We right. Absolutely. In a row. And that's probably what, how maybe most of the meetings are there because there's so many people in the room that you can't have a, you can't have a discussion meeting, but most of the meetings and uh, AA meetings in the Midwest are basically discussion meetings and usually smaller, but probably bigger than the eight or 10. There's probably, I, like I know at our, our meeting in our, our agnostic meeting in KC, there's usually like at the Tuesday and Thursday meeting, 12 to 15 people, I mm -hmm. guess. I think um, that's but, how many were there when I went that one time. Yeah, that's, that's typical. And it really hasn't gone uh, much beyond that. And we, uh, during the five years that we've been meeting, that mm -hmm. seems to be every once in a while, it might spike up to 20 people or whatever, but that seems right. to be the, the standard. Well, and that's even in Lincoln, you know, the speaker meetings are two on Sunday mornings and one was in a church and somebody mm -hmm. was up in the pulpit giving their story and the other was set up like church. It was basically church for people. Yeah, it is. It is. And actually in some of the meetings, some of the meetings like the Clancy types are totally like church. I mean, you oh, dress yeah. up and all that kind of stuff too. Yeah, for sure. We, I think there's still, I, I was tempted to go to it the other night. Um, there's one in Bellevue around here. That's still like one of those Fox hall meetings where everybody, mm -hmm. and it says on the thing, you need to dress up to come. That's weird. So I was tempted weird. to go just to, uh, just to peek at what it's like, but I, sometimes I feel like I want to just be like a journalist where I go in and peek at these things I and know. I can just look at it from a, without any vested interest. Well, that's how I, that's how I view my, myself now with the whole secular AA thing. I like to see myself as actually an AA itself. I'm more of an observer than anything else, mm -hmm. you know, and I do kind of, I do find it interesting, the different, like the variety of experiences and the clashes and it's just really interesting yeah. what's going on. But while that's interesting, I have that little part of me, I also want to get kind of away from that and look at the, the, the rest of the world outside of that. Right. And how funny it is that all the people who are interested in secular AA meetings don't seem to be interested in smart or life ring. Yeah, yeah, that's, that that's true. That's a good point. <laughs> I don't I understand about that, that really. Well, and I don't, I feel like maybe you're in the same place I am about stuff, but it's like, secular AA was kind of my transition out of feeling like I have to be in recovery the rest of my life. Right. Not that I'm I, not that there. I, not that I have a plan to drink or anything, but Me it's either. Um, I don't I, know exactly. I, at some point in my life, I'm probably going to stop um, being a person in recovery, I think, and just kind of go on. A, I mean, Susan and I are talking about wanting to do some traveling, you know, already my meeting attendance has, has gone down quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to pick it up again or not. Um, I feel when I'm in a meeting, I feel almost kind of silly sometimes mm -hmm. because I see people that are sitting there who are struggling and trying just getting started. And I'm sitting here, I've been sober for 31 years. You know, it's like, I, I just feel like I, I, they can't relate to, with that. You know, that, mm -hmm. what do I have? You know, the, you know, and my experience is so from so long ago. I right. mean, it's like, even when I share my story with them, I mean, I'm talking about pay phones and shit that just, just doesn't, yeah. I'm, well, a I'm a dinosaur along those lines too i think robert brought it up about the guilt and the shame sometimes those hardcore meetings again not the meetings you tend to go to but it yeah. it does to me from a counseling perspective it does tend to perpetuate guilt and shame for certain people yeah um some people need to have their consciences challenged and and feel some guilt and shame that maybe they hadn't felt yet but there's some people who are perpetually beating them up and i think I, I do think the, the crossover of people that tend to go to secular AA are those people who maybe had problems with guilt and shame or were sick and tired of getting that beat in their head. I have yeah. kind of found that a little bit, but yeah. there's something about the 12 step program that has a tough time letting you move on. Or if you grow out of it, it's your fault rather than 
a, a normal growth pattern. And you brought up about maybe it wasn't even good to go back and talk about the past stuff that happened. And I think the thing is the pressure on talking about that is what's tough. I think there's a natural progression that happens for each person whenever they're ready for it. If you can and do you and the, I have talked before that sometimes the it's not that should be better left to a professional, right? I mean, sometimes the the person who's hearing that fifth step really isn't equipped to hear to deal with those that kind of trauma in Syria and, and, right. and, and it's not a, not the right place to do it. Right. But I'm I'm starting to learn that from the I'm like I told you before, where I'm doing the smart recovery um, facilitator training, and they do not delve into the past. They don't, don't they don't do an inventory, mm -hmm. but they do look at the 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 ABCs of what's going on presently. Right. And trying to say, okay, so you have this event going on in your life right now, and you're thinking about that event is causing you to feel this way. Yeah. It's all in the here and now, rather than thinking about like, oh, I resent something that happened yesterday, and it's making me feel this way. Right. Or I resent something that happened 30 years ago, and it's making me behave this way. It's just kind of interesting. I mean, I found it, like I said, I found it kind of helpful for me to do that to go back in the past and kind of mm -hmm. learn about myself. But you also, it also makes me question, was I, was I, was it really helpful? You know, or was, you know, did I, what did I learn? Did I learn about myself because I was just kind of going to meetings and thinking about myself and thinking about my past and relating to meetings or, you know, who, who knows for sure. Who or, knows? or would we have come to different conclusions at a different time if we weren't so pressed into that? Or, yeah. or you know, sometimes 12 step has a way of framing everything a certain way. And maybe, maybe that's yeah. not accurate. I don't know. I do think, I think, of course, I'm going to say it's good to go back and look at the past, but I think on a person's own time frame it is good, but also yeah. it's don't tough be because sure. you don't want to put it off because obviously if, if none of us ever never had to do anything, we probably wouldn't, but I think yeah. if you can just focus on overall emotional health, that stuff presents itself like stuff that I, you know, I did multiple four steps, stuff that I was more prepared to deal with later came up later, you know, yeah. and I didn't do them at first. Now, some hardcore person might say, well, you weren't thorough enough the first time. No, maybe I wasn't emotionally prepared enough to deal with that at that time. And then I am here at six years sober, eight years sober. Yeah. And I think yeah. The freedom outside of 12 step rooms allows allows more of a just a human growth and change rather than constantly framing it as well, you're screwed up, you're diseased, you're wrong, you're broken. Mm -hmm. um, that's just my my perspective right now. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna have to go, I think. Um, it's nice talking to you. For yeah. anybody who's running across this YouTube video, what what I what we're doing is um, for the YouTube's portion the live stream we're going to do always do this little overtime after but for the audio podcast i'm just going to end it where we do the music so the podcast audio version will be a little bit shorter and if somebody wants to hear the after the bill maher overtime stuff <laughs> they have to come to youtube yeah <laughs> anyway thank just you as, sure to be just as popular as bill maher's over i think so sure. i don't see why not i'm sure <laughs> all right i'll talk to you later all right take care john bye-bye uh, bye-bye